Hello, and welcome to the social chase. Here with me is my mom at the host, or well, co-host actually. And I'd like to thank uh, Victoria as our guest for today. Victoria is from Akalaka Services, and I would like to tell you about herself. Victoria joins us from akalaka.org, a community of support and resources for siblings who care for siblings with intellectual and developmental disabilities, which she began so no one in our community ever feels alone or lost navigating disability services. So welcome, Victoria, and glad to have you here. Thank you, Chase and Helen. I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> Thank welcome. you, Victoria, for joining us. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So what is the goal of Akawaka? Okay, good question. Um, so um, I started Akalaka for my own journey as a sibling. Um, I've technically been a caregiver for over 20 years, but I didn't really fully identify with that identity um, until I was reaching a breaking point um, at the beginning of the pandemic of um, kind of hitting walls with accessing services um, and advocating in the right way to help support my sibling. Um, and so on that journey, I ended up speaking with um, other caregivers and siblings. And I just recognized that we all shared two things in common, feelings of being alone on a journey and also feelings of being lost navigating services. Um, and so the goal of Akalaka is really to fill this gap that I've noticed of um, not really having a network of care partners um, and also not having clear pathways to accessing services. Um, so our goal is to one, um, make people feel better connected and also to, to um, give people guides on the journey to accessing services to support um, themselves and their family. That's such a wonderful concept, Victoria. Yeah. It's just amazing that you as a sibling, you know, just knew not only to, I need to do this for myself, but you know, this is something that was needed nationwide and all over. So, and just to start this program, it's just so amazing. Um, yeah, thank you. and. Uh, it hasn't been easy even to decide to do this. Um, I wasn't sure if it was for me to do this because I'm not um, I'm not a professional social worker and and I my experience and knowledge comes from our personal journey um, and just the walls that I hit and needing to overcome them. Um, uh, but I'm thankful like hearing your perspective and also the feedback from siblings in our community that it is something that a lot of people need and we're learning along the way and ho hopefully making it better with each step. Exactly. So how did Akalaka get started? Um, so we started, um, as I mentioned, um, from my own personal experience, I had been hitting walls. And so I started to attend a lot of webinars online throughout the pandemic. Um, so between 2020 and 2021, I, I was attending like hundreds of webinars, almost like maybe twice a week, um, uh, hosted by different community organizations on um, like how to access services and supports. And I noticed in those chat, chats of those webinars, many families would be expressing similar frustrations of just things not being clear to them. Um, and so that was like a signal for me that, hey, I'm not the only one experiencing this. Um, and so I took time kind of just along with everything, all my other responsibilities of just meeting with um, over 91 family caregivers over the course of the summertime, um, virtually through Zoom. Um, and, uh, and during those conversations, I um, just wanted to know if the pains that I was feeling was consistent with other people. Um, and so that definitely validated it with over 100 people I spoke with. Um, and then specifically, I noticed that siblings felt those two things, feelings of loneliness and feelings of being in the wilderness at like a they felt it the most, but they were pretty underaddressed um, because uh, providers typically focus on parents. Um, but as parents age and siblings become adults, they end up with responsibilities that they haven't really been prepared for, and they don't really have a community of people, peers that they can reach out to. Um, and so that that was like the the decision point for me to start Akalaka. Um, and so we first started off with um, an, an, an introductory class. So I basically. Um, developed a online class. Um, I produced videos and I post hosted it on this platform for people to be able to access in a self-paced way. Um, and I invited a cohort of six siblings to basically be the beta testers for this. Um, so 
over the course of five weeks, um, they went through this curriculum together and I would host check-ins once a week for people to um, just connect with each other and give feedback. Um, and by the end of those five weeks, people's ratings on the level of clarity, the level of confidence and their level of, um, of connection increased significantly across the board. Um, so that told me that one, like that this was needed and two, that this would make a difference. Um, and so from there, it just kind of snowballed to host uh, two more cohorts um, by the end of the year. And then um, this, this year we're focusing a lot more on social connection. So I've been featuring other siblings in the community um, for seminars and socials. Um, so that's kind of how we're starting. We're still in the early stages, um, but I would say a lot of our starting is just from the community and the feedback that I get from people of what's needed and what can be improved. So that's just very impressive. The time you took um, to do, not only to say, let me just start something, but you based it on interrelationships with others and on data of conversations with other people, and which is very, which is that probably the scientific, scientific person in your, because I understand you have a scientific background, which makes a lot of sense. And so I was wondering, can you like share a little bit of your journey? Because you are a sibling. So can you share with others, you know, what it's like, you know, I understand you have a sister. If you want to share a little bit about that um, in terms of how you came to the decision that you are going to take care of her. I mean, it mm -hmm. might not have been a no brainer for you, but just share with others because I know there's got to, there has to be some siblings out there saying, oh my goodness, you know, Chase, is, he has an older brother too. But you know, when it's our time, it's like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? So what did you do in that moment of what am I going to do? Okay, yeah, good question. And I would say, yeah, I've spoken with a lot of siblings who are kind of in this gray area where they expect that at some point they'll need to care, for, like take primary care responsibilities for their sibling, but they, they're not sure exactly what that would look like or when that could happen, um, or they don't really have a plan in place. Um, um, and I would say for me, um, I definitely wasn't expecting to take on this primary care responsibility so soon or so early on. I, I kind of remember a few years ago, I was, just, I was looking forward to the doing this like maybe later in life. Um, uh, but then just with our own personal situation, um, unexpectedly our mom passed away and, um, and it kind of was like an automatic response for me to not, um, to make sure that my sister wasn't left hanging um, because it's such a big uh, tran like transition for all of us, just regardless of any disability of um, losing our mom. Um, and then also um, in that time as she was finishing school, just thinking about what the next steps would be for her. And I, I didn't want there to be such a big drastic, um, drastic change in her life. Um, I wanted it to be as, um, as fam familiar and comfortable for her as possible. Um, so I think for me, it was just kind of thinking, okay, um, professionally, I was already on a path of completing my own degree in school. So I was in my final year of my PhD program. And even at that point, I wasn't even sure if I was going to be graduating because I need, needed to finish my 300 page dissertation. And I wasn't even halfway done when our mom passed away. But I just remember my mom's voice of encouraging me, uh, even when she was um, in the hospital at that time to like so I'll bring my work in and do it. I just do that. Um, and my mom would um, would encourage me to complete what I had started with her. And and although it was pretty hard, like and I, I don't even fully remember. I feel like it was a complete blur that final semester. But I just really, um, I think for for me, what helped me was just maintaining the faith that I had, um, knowing that you know although what we're going through is so challenging, knowing that. Um, God will give me everything I needed and time to be able to handle these challenges. Um, and it's a day-to-day -day thing for me to remember it, remind myself that yes, I can, even if it's hard. Um, so I think I just, um, I think it's just my own nature that I just felt like I, this is something that I, I was looking forward to and it came sooner than, than I expected, but that things would work out. And so I did have to kind of adjust my original professional plans that I was potentially going to travel out of state for work. Um, so I kind of have to adjust, okay, finding alternative ways to potentially work remotely and to combine the work that I was doing professionally with my personal responsibilities. So it was just kind of 
not sure what would come around the corner and just doing my best to, um, to make adjustments each step of the way, just to make sure that I could be present for my sister. You are such a blessing. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing and some people just expect it. And some people are like, no way I would never think of doing that. And just your mom did a great job. That's all I can say. She did a beautiful job with her, with her, her daughter and being a big sister is, is enough, but being a big sister, taking care of your sibling with special needs, it's just, I really commend what you did. And I it's just, I'm just so impressed by you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And yeah, I would say it's, um, it's not like a, I was so, what's the word? Like, not that I, um, like I really didn't know what would what would happen next. So it's just more sort of keeping the faith with each step to know, okay, I don't know what's gonna happen next, but I'll do what I can in this moment. And with the hope of that, you know, things will work out in the right timing. Sure. What does Aka Laka offer? Okay, good question. So um, as I mentioned, like, because we are starting up or basically a startup and we're adjusting to what our community needs. Um, I'm sure that what we offer today will probably be different to, um, uh, next year or in a few years, just based off of the feedback we get. But right now we offer a monthly series of seminars and socials for siblings to connect with each other. Um, so for example, in January, we hosted a seminar on self-care for sibling caregivers and it was hosted by a sibling who went over some of the theories of self-care, but then by the end of that session, people were practical, were able to use practical tools of um, assessing where they currently are with self-care and what they could do, um, like small steps they could take to improve their self-care. Um, and then in February, we hosted a social um, on black history music. Um, and so it was nothing really directly about being a sibling or disabilities, it was just pure fun. And during our socials, we encourage for siblings to invite their siblings to participate for free um, because we really wanna build a sense of community and friendship so that um, our sibling members and their siblings um, can build friendship with other families. Um, mm -hmm. And so we do that on a monthly basis, alternating between seminars for education and socials for connection. Um, so that's the, the main thing, but then throughout like um, 24 seven, we have a community online where people can start discussion threads, um, reach out one-on-one -on -one or have group chats um, and do it kind of in a, in a relatively safe environment of, to ask questions and get feedback. Um, and then we also are growing a network of professionals that people can tap into. So attorneys, therapists, that members in our community would get a discount on. And over time, we wanna um, have recommendations for people based off of their experience with those professionals. Uh, and then alongside all of this, we also, um, each season, we have a themed group coaching session. Um, so throughout this winter season, for example, we've had um, a, um, a uh, meditation group coaching session, which is led by a sibling who also happens to be a therapist. And so it was like a 20 minutes of just pausing on the second Mondays of this uh, season and, and each month, um, we're able to just have time to just actually practice some form of self-care together. Um, and so we offer these different like um, ways people to check in with each other and also to um, to learn and to grow. Um, and as I mentioned, our vision um, over time is to really build out new tools and solutions that are risk responsive to what our members need. I'm listening and thinking more and more. So I just want people to know that this is a na nationwide program and it's, it's a membership based program. So for more information about membership, make sure you go to akalaka.org. Um, so it's important for you to know that it's, it's a, but when you're a membership program, it's, you know, people who have to register. And so, you know, who's part of the group. And so I would just say, that's really a fantastic thing. And she's, and there's so much services that are offering with this. And just the fact that you're also being inclusive of the individuals with special needs, with the siblings in conversation, which I think it's important because sometimes they keep the conversation separate while well, I take care of my brother, I take care of my sister, but they don't really have conversations together. So I think that's a fantastic idea. What I do sometimes, um, actually twice a month is I have a social chase bingo night. Mm -hmm. So, and they love it. So I mean, maybe like you guys could do like a bingo night for, cause you could do a virtual bingo. Yeah, actually, that's a good idea. I'd, yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, they learn love. More. I'll send you. I'll send you information. But virtual, they love virtual bingo. So I'll send you mm -hmm. how I do it, and that's a fun thing. And so, and then we have typical and you know, neurotypical, and neurodiverse um, mm -hmm. parents, and anybody's invited to do that. So it's it's a fun thing to do. Um. So, 
I was wondering, so what are ways that parents could support what you're trying to do? Okay, yeah, so um, I do think parents play an important role just because um, the relationships that people have with their, especially if you have multiple children, um, of just recognizing what stage your children are. So sometimes maybe um, your the siblings are close in age to each other. Sometimes they're a bit further apart in age. And and um, and one thing. Uh, so another sibling I've been speaking with. She's actually going to be leading a seminar this month on um, responding to siblings in crises. Um, but she's a, an expert on the, on this topic of thinking about um, basically how to include um, the whole family in the planning process. Um, mm. Sometimes. You know, like I mentioned, I've been caregiving for over 20 years, so that, mean, that meant I started pretty young, um, and I didn't really, of course, at a young age, I didn't fully recognize the response, like the responsibilities that I was taking on, and how probably my peers at school didn't have the same uh, uh, responsibilities when they went home if they if they had neurotypical siblings, um, and so I think kind of recognizing the weight that the other um, the other children are carrying. Um, which might be sometimes invisible or not acknowledged. And I think the first step is really to acknowledge that, yes, like you are um, taking, um, taking some role that is typically maybe expected a parent to take just because it is a lot for any single person to manage. Um, it's basically like a professional, um, there are some professional there's some things that we do that typically people are professionally trained to do, like when in caregiving, that makes sense. But because we're a family, we don't necessarily get training or counseling to, to do this. We just we just know that this needs to get done and, and we're in a position, position to do this. So we do this. And so I think rec acknowledging what the roles that siblings play and then also um, helping them so that, the, that they can access resources um, to help to, um, for them to get the support they need at different stages. And so, um, for younger siblings, I think, uh, especially if they're not yet adults, um, depending on which location they're in, there are some, there are some programs like um, through uh, the Sibling Leadership Network, it's called Sib Shops. It's something, I didn't, I didn't know about it when I was younger, but I've heard about it more recently. That's meant for children um, who are siblings to actually just connect with other peers um, and to have social activities together. So then kind of tapping into those local resources um, so that people know that they're not alone in their journey early on. Um, and then I think as people become adults, definitely like tapping into a network like Akalaka would be helpful because um, I think this is the number one thing I hear from people is that they, 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 they've never met anyone else who shared this identity with them. And so uh, I think parents can encourage uh, their other children to just connect with a network like Akalaka so that one, they have a, 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 an outlet where they can share any um, concerns they have, any um, things that are bothering them and to have a place they can go to and not to feel like they're alone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then two, to also include as much as the child is, especially when they become adults and they're willing and interested to include them in the planning process. Um, Cause I know sometimes parents don't want to overload their children because you know everyone has their own life to live. But I think if, a, if another child expresses interest in helping out in the future, then I think including them um, within the planning process so that at least they become, become to get familiar with the terminology, with the stakeholders that are involved and they feel empowered to speak up um, and to share their perspective, because you know, I think the lens that we we look at our siblings as a sibling is different sometimes than the lens the parents um, look at their children. Oh, true. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, like, um, so sometimes, and this is also some research on this. Like, sometimes, you know, as a sibling, and, and I know this from my own experience. I, I, I have really great ambitions for my sister, and some things that she may not be able to communicate for herself. Then I can advocate for that during the planning process of. Hey, I think she'd do really well in this campus program, or I think she, we should start looking at maybe independent living options, those kinds of things that maybe siblings might speak up first, you know, maybe before even a parent feels comfortable letting go of some of those, um, those things that they hold on to just from being a parent. So I just encourage um, two things, one for parents to acknowledge um, and to like, in, to share resources so these siblings know they have um, places they can go to, and then two, to include the sibling as best as they can in the planning process. That makes sense. I mean, that might even like be like a great another um, seminar, a webinar you could do is, you know, have the parent with their children discussion. How do you prepare your child um, to 
potentially be the caretaker for their sibling. Um, I, and, I, and I remember we were talking, you were telling me how you were reading through all the, the um, 300 pages of, was it? Um, yes, that Medicaid waiver program. Medicaid policy. waiver program. And so share a little bit more about that because that was very interesting and because you had a certain, you have a certain knowledge because you read through everything. Every parent, us parents, we're like, oh, we don't want to read all this stuff. So mm -hmm. share that knowledge because that's important knowledge that if you're reading these certain documents, you understand these documents, it's very valuable information. So share um, what you what you um, read and, and how it inspired you to help others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually, um, so as I mentioned, I was kind of hitting a wall with accessing services to my sister and it wasn't so much that um, uh, the case manager wasn't willing to help, it was more so like I was just speaking a different language than, than what was um, to translate it into like what exactly a service is called and like what the requirements of the services are. And so it definitely um, helped once I got more clarity, it reduced kind of the gap in terms of communication and I could then also reduce the, the delay time and, um, and waiting to hear back about something that maybe I requested for in a weird way. Um, and so that's kind of the basis of the class that I designed, um, which was basically regardless of whatever state that you're in in, in the United States, um, I have a method for how you can actually review your state's policy program because they all kind of follow the same templates in terms of what states submit to the federal government for um, for the services that they want to provide and be covered through the Medicaid waiver program. Um, and so if anyone is diagnosed with developmental disabilities, um, uh, regardless of um, regardless of, uh, of whether or not they're enrolled in the program, they, they technically would be eligible for these services. Um, sometimes people, when people hear Medicaid, they think it's based off of income and maybe they're, they don't qualify, but it's with the waiver program, the point of the word waiver is really, it waives the typical requirements from Medicaid, if that makes sense. So typically Medicaid does things based off of income um, or some other requirements. So the waiver waives those requirements and it, it based off of what the state determines their requirement is. And so um, some states may call it like a developmental disability waiver. Some states call it autism waiver. This depends, TBI, there's so many different diagnoses they use. So it varies wherever you are. Um, but the point of that waiver is to provide long-term support services um, that people can receive at home and in their community rather than in a nursing facility. Um, and so if someone has that level of nursing facility requirements, um, but they prefer to live at home and in the community, then the, this waiver is meant to cover the cost of that. And it's pretty advantageous for the government to have this waiver program because it actually saves the government a lot of money when people live at home and in their community rather than in a nursing facility. Um, and they started around the 80s and 90s when this kind of came about and just it wasn't like a complete wave of just transformation. It, it kind of was came about because of also a lot of um, lawsuits that people made because of the poor conditions they had in nursing facilities at the time. Um, and so it's really something that people should one be aware of and two take advantage of if they're eligible for them. Um, but it's also not so easy to navigate. Um, so for example, in North Carolina, there's over 15,000 people who are currently waiting to get a slot in this program. And so um, although it exists and they're eligible because of just the way the funding is, it's not everyone can get it when they need it. So some people wait up to 10 years or longer before they can finally get a slot. Um, and so right now, I'm kind of, it's, it's a lot to explain, so I'm just going to try to summarize, but just to give you a, a, um, an idea of what's currently happening, there's a, um, a lot of advocacy around, um, one, like increasing the number of, of slots that are available for people, and then two, also just, um, also just increasing the funding for these services um, so that people who do have a slot, they are not capped, if that makes sense, be, um, beneath what they actually need. Um, and so, yeah, so in the class, I kind of go over the first part is just, okay, what is this thing? And like, what's the background of it? And then the second step is like, um, how do you find what your state offers? Um, the third step is like to know that some states actually have funding available to cover what Akalaka provides. Um, and so it's called caregiver counseling and training. Um, and yeah, and so if people um, need assistance with this, and just even if you don't necessarily think that, if you, even if you think you can afford it yourself, it's still helpful to, to, um, to include this within your plan because 
if, um, for example, if it's a parent who's getting training now, um, it would be good to for whoever whoever it might step in um, beyond the parent to also have this training as well. Does it make sense? Right. Um, and so we go over kind of what what's available. So along with training and counseling, um, states also typically provide respite, which is like a backup caregiver support. So if you need a break or a time off, then you can actually request this time to be covered either by a, another child of yours who can actually get paid for the time they're spending or an out, outside person who is a professional to assist. Um, and so we go over kind of those specific services. And then by the end of the five weeks, people, one, also know how to, um, to reach out to their case manager and how to request services and how to include that in the plan and to know um, how assessments that are being done. Um, so at, annually or biannually, sometimes there are assessments that um, the case the case management system needs to do on, on the individual to understand the level of support. And so that assessment and how you respond to that can actually affect what budget is included for the next year. So we kind of just cover like a, a overall, like what this is and um, how we can better navigate the system. Yeah. So we also have the issue of Connecticut's so autism waiver list. So when, in, in um, Connecticut, we have separated uh, Department of Development Services and Department of Social Services. So if an individual has an IQ 69 and below, they're part of the Department of Development Services. They don't have to worry about a waiver. If your I IQ is higher, you have to go on a waiver. And Chase has been on this waiver for over five years with nothing because he's on a wait list. Mm -hmm. And the issue with that is that if more of us parents have to really come together and talk to our legislators and really implore the importance of us, of our individuals having um, services, because even though their IQ is high, can they live independently? Can mm -hmm. they, you know, drive? Can they, you know, work independently? And if not, what happens to them? Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, we, we would love to remove the IQ um, standards or the IQ, I um, can't think of the word, the IQ re requirements for DDS, but then they're like, oh, there's no money. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so why start a program if you have no money? So now a waiting list that used to be 30, then it went to 100, now there's thousands of people waiting. Mm -hmm. very frustrated uh, and now some of their adults their children there were children or teenagers at the time are now aging out of that list and never received the services mm -hmm. that they needed for that child right. so it is a challenge and, and and i see that you have the same type of issue in north carolina but that's going to have to be a movement with government um the senators or your i mean your local government first but then maybe you know press more on see it, is there federal dollars, enough federal dollars coming for, in for that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it's, yeah, definitely at, at all levels for services because, you know, it's um it's kind of, uh, well, it's fragmented, like how services are provided to people. So okay. sometimes even at the county level, like the Department of Social Services can provide some services that people need, um, like including like food and nutrition benefits. Um, and then at the the city level, there's like transportation services if people need shuttle services. And then at the state level, there's the Department of like Health and Human Services and the Development of the Department. And, and I think what you mentioned about the IQ requirements, it's kind of like, um, I think those, maybe when those things were initially set up, it's meant to kind of make it easier for the, the assessors to determine who, um, who needs what and what. But I think sometimes it might actually, um, it doesn't consider like the practical uh, result that makes sense. Like how you mentioned, um, the IQ may not tell you about the person's independent living ability or what supports they need at home. So I do think um, uh, I do think that perhaps like this whole system, the way that it's been designed, it, it, it has a lot of room to be like fully redesigned in a way to just um, to even make it not necessarily based off of um, of people like needing to apply to get services, but to kind of have it like a, um, a baseline of, if you've already been diagnosed with this, we know that this comes with certain needs and we're gonna kind of have this, Right. you're pre-enrolled and basically you have an option to opt out if you don't right. need this, right. yeah. but don't make it so that everyone has to kind of go through like this. Uh, yeah, make it so difficult. Yeah, so, 
yeah, so I definitely feel like there's a lot of room for improvement, but I think my goal is like kind of, okay, this is where the system is today and how do you navigate it? And then also hopefully learning as we learn more about it, then we know, okay, this is what we, we can advocate for more of, if it makes sense. Because for example, like how I mentioned, some states offer this caregiver counseling and training funding. It's not every state, it's actually a minority of states. Um, but the thing is, I think if more caregivers are aware that this is even available, like on a federal level, then I think people can advocate on the state level that we need this too. Um, maybe people didn't think about this when they were just developing the policy for our state. So I'm hoping that the more we know, the, the better we can advocate for what people need. And that's the beauty of your program, because you are going to be, you are a nationwide program that you have these conversations all throughout the United States. Um, everybody helps each other out, just a certain voice going on, and the people are going to start listening more and more, which is which will be very beneficial for everybody. Mm -hmm. Jace, you have yeah. any other questions you want to ask? Anything you want to ask? What does Aka Laka mean? Okay, yeah, great question. Um, so Aka Laka is a word um, from uh, Libo, Ibo, which is a language from Nigeria where I was born, um, and Aka Laka has a double meaning. Um, the literal meaning is handprint. So um, uh, our handprints, they differ, but they have a general kind of common pattern, you know, that we all have together, but they're all, they're all different. So, um, but then the deeper meaning of this is about destiny and our shared destiny that we have. And so the vision with Akalaka is that over time, we recognize the shared destiny that we have in, um, in needing to receive care and also needing to give care, because I think, um, and actually kind of, although we, we use the term caregiver a lot throughout today, um, I'm kind of um, navigating more toward using the term care partner, because I think mm. um, as we, like we, we both have a role to play in caring for each other. Um, and so the assumption, you know, on a general level is that the person with disability is the one who needs, needs, needs care. But I do think like, I know, I know it's from my own relationship with my sister that I get, I get so much from her as well. And so we're kind of in a partnership where I'm learning about her needs and she's also learning about mine and we're kind of coming together to support each other. And I think as we get older also, I'll need care, more care as well. And, and you never know like what um, life will bring to you. And so I think we, we start with the current state that we're in, but I think uh, the idea is that we all have this shared destiny where we'll need um, care, whether it's for ourselves or for our loved ones. And so um, with Aklaka, the, the idea is for us to join hand in hand to better handle life together. I love that because that you're at 100% correct. Um, it is a partnership and, it, and it's not just, you know, I'm just taking care of you. It's that I'm benefiting from taking care of you, but you're also taking care of me in certain ways that you don't really know. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, I love that. That's, that's wonderful. That's great. Yeah. And I do hope that like, um, like, you know, I mentioned about the siblings having like the social time together to build friendship. Like I, I do hope that we have more people who care about our siblings over time. Yeah. So even if they're not a direct care, um, they're not directly caring for them, they care about them. So um, so if they're, for example, I know some siblings, like you mentioned, your older son is in a different state. Um, and uh, if, if there's a local sibling of another family who gets to know Chase over time, then I think uh, it's like a sense of relief to know that, okay, it's not only my close, my, uh, direct family who cares about my sibling, but there's a community, a network of people who also care about their well-being and will look out for them over time. So I, I do hope that we get to that point where um, where we do have a sense of relief knowing that more people care about our right. people. It's, it's, it's a peace of mind. So exactly. So say my son's like, well, I want to stay where I'm at. And, but somebody, uh, one of our family members is willing to take care of Chase. Meanwhile, he still has to make sure Chase is being taken care of the correct way. Mm -hmm. So it's still them taking care of them, but you know, maybe yeah. not directly, but you, st you still have to look out for your brother to make sure right. he's mm -hmm. okay. And so that's mm -hmm. absolutely, that's 100% correct when you're saying that. Mm -hmm. Chase, anything else you want to ask or? Or say? Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, talking to us about your company and services. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you, Victoria. I really appreciated that. I think this is very valuable. I'm impressed of what you're doing. And I hope you, everybody who has a sibling will join Akalaka. Go to akalaka.org, A-K-A-L-A-K-A.org. We'll have more information for everyone at the end of the show, but 
Thank you so much for calling and being part of the social chase. Thank you, Chase. Great job for asking questions. Yes, good job. Thanks.